St. Christopher in downtown Maine. Black Madonna, fingers holding the flame. I saw the eagle rise right out of the blue. and the Jewish high court. Sentenced to death, he is brought to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate to carry out the sentence. Pilate, unable to find any reason to carry out the sentence, finally gives in to the wishes of the crowd. Jesus is led to Calvary, a place of execution just outside the city walls, where he is crucified between two criminals. <coughs> For three hours, darkness fell over this place of the skull. From the cross, Jesus cries out, Into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. Today, it is obvious to see how these events change the history of the world. But at the time, those who were involved with this passion play were unaware of the changes being wrought. These people were people like you and me, people with feelings and emotions, people who didn't always understand the impact of their own decisions. Let us listen now to the lamentation of the women of Jerusalem as we begin our road to Calvary. How solitary sits the city once filled with people. She who was great among the nations is now like a widow. All her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. The, the roads to Zion mourn empty of a pilgrim's to her feasts. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan. Her young women grieve, her lot is bitter. Her foes have come out on top, her enemies <coughs> are secure. From daughter Zion has gone, her glory. 
Jerusalem has sinned grievously. She has become a mockery. Those who honor her now demean her, for they saw her nakedness. She herself groans out loud and turns away. Peter stands in the courtyard just outside where Jesus has been sentenced to death. That look he just gave me. He just stared at me. Stared as if he knew. As if he knew that I had just denied knowing him. When Jesus needed me the most, I deserted him. At our Passover meal, he said he would be betrayed by one of our group. I couldn't believe this. I boldly proclaimed I would stay by his side, even to death. But he said I wouldn't be there. He said I would deny him three times. I let him down in the garden at Gethsemane. He asked me to stay awake with him, but I fell asleep. After he was arrested and led away by the soldiers, I was afraid to follow. I tried to hide, but someone spotted me and asked if I was one of his followers. All these people were looking at me. They looked angry. What else could I do? I didn't want Jesus to suffer, but would it have made things better to say that I knew him? So I denied knowing him. How could I have done this to my friend? How could I have done this to the man I swore to stand by? Moments ago, as they led him away, our eyes met, and I know that he knew. He knew what I had just done. What would you do if your friend was unfairly arrested? What would you do if you had the power to pardon someone who was unfairly arrested? The Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, had that opportunity. Why did they bring this man? He is a Jew. They say he violated the Jewish law. What has this to do with me, this Jesus of Nazareth? Caiaphas and the Jewish priests of the high court have condemned this man to death, but they refuse to carry out the sentence. They say it is forbidden during their feast of Passover. Why do they feel so strongly about executing this man now? I asked, he hardly appears to be a threat. I asked him about the charges brought before him, but he wouldn't answer. Why didn't he answer? He seems like an intelligent man. Why didn't he defend himself? Why did he not give me a reason to let him go? The crowd is out of control. They just kept shouting for his execution, shouting that he is against Caesar, that he is a threat to the Roman authority. They just kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The crowd was on the verge of a riot. I couldn't let that happen. The Roman government expects me to keep the peace. So, I thought I could quiet the crowd by having Jesus flogged. Thirty-nine lashes from the whip is a very harsh punishment for someone who has done nothing wrong. But the flow of blood only fed the hungry crowd. They only shouted louder for his execution. What could I do? If I let this man go, the mob would have turned against me. I would have been in trouble with Rome, with Caesar. I would have failed in my job as governor. What else could I do? I am a civil servant. I must serve my government, and I must do the job that my government has asked me to do. This man, this Jesus, is just one man. Whether he lives or dies is of no consequence to me. I wash my hands of this man. If you want him killed, then he will die. But do not blame me. That look he gave me, it wasn't a look of pity. It wasn't a look of condemnation. It was a look of love. My friend, who I denied, still loves me. 
I don't deserve that. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred were his features, beyond that of mortals, his appearance, beyond that of human beings, so shall he startle many nations. Kings shall stand speechless. He was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, a man of knowing pain like ones in whom you turn your face. Spurned, and we held him in no esteem, yet it was our pain he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole, by his wounds we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, all following our own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though harshly treated, he submitted and did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, or a sheep silent for shears, he, he did, did not, not open his mouth. Seized and condemned, he was taken away. Not everyone sees Jesus the same way. Sometimes, even our closest friends think we are something that we are not. God, what have I done? I, I didn't mean for this to happen. Why couldn't we start over? Everything made sense in the beginning. We were going to restore the Jewish kingdom, drive the Romans out of our land. Jesus, you were such an inspirational speaker. Thousands of people flocked to hear you. And the money was flowing in. So much support from so many people. The time was right when we were peaking, marching toward Jerusalem. All we were waiting was for you to say the word and the revolution would start. You never said the word. Thousands of people ready to join the cause and you didn't give them the word. I got impatient. We wanted the kingdom now. I thought maybe I could light the fire, that I could start the revolution. So I plotted to have the Jewish leaders in front of you in a quiet place where you could give us the word to begin the revolution. There we were, standing in Gethsemane, you, the twelve of the Jewish leaders, we could have marched down the hill to the city and started the revolution from the Temple Mount. But all you said was put away your sword and everything went horribly wrong. Instead of marching to victory, you marched to your death. This is not what I wanted. Mistake. You are going to die, and it is all my fault. My selfishness has brought you down. There can't be any forgiveness for this. Damn. For all time. Judas made the mistake of seeing himself in Jesus rather than 
seen Jesus in himself. The high priest Caiaphas can only see himself. It will be over soon. Jesus of Nazareth, that thorn in my side, will be eliminated. It's what he deserves. Imagine claiming to be God, fooling ignorant people into believing that you are the Messiah. If anyone would recognize the Messiah, it would be me, the high priest of the Jewish people. None of your followers have the education or wisdom necessary to discern such matters. You took advantage of them. Well, it's a good thing the Jewish people have me to guide them. Jesus, why did you think that you could get away with this? Your followers claim that you spoke with authority. Well, that's not surprising when you consider how you told them they didn't need to follow the law. You cannot claim authority over the law. Over the priests and scribes? Over me? We hold the power of authority. You are nothing more than a carpenter from Nazareth. So, why did you do this? Why were you always trying to trick us with your questions? What did you have to gain from taking us on? Well, you couldn't keep it up. It was only a matter of time before we got on your little charade. Before the Sanhedrin, you claimed to be the Son of God. Ha! Blasphemy! And in front of witnesses, we had you dead to rights! Still, it was almost like you knew this was going to happen to you. To be able to hold your own with the smartest men in Jerusalem is quite an accomplishment. Where does a poor man from a backwater town get such knowledge and wisdom? No. No, we will soon be rid of him! Do we ever question who has the real authority in our lives? Let us listen to the words of the psalmist. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord. Let, Let him deliver him. him. If he loves him, let him rescue him. Many bulls surround me, fierce bulls encircle me. All who see me open their mouths against me, lions that rend and roar. Like water, my life drains away. All my bones are disjointed. Dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. The young women of Jerusalem bow their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with tears and my stomach churns. As children and infants collapse in the streets of the town, they cry out to their mothers. The streets of Jerusalem echo with the sounds of suffering. Let us listen to the voices of the afflicted. I had an ordinary life in the village of Magdala. You might call it a boring life. But then things changed. Suddenly I began to hear voices that destroyed my ordinary life. These voices, these demons constantly talked to me, leaving me no peace. These voices confused me, made me fear other people. All I wanted was my ordinary life back. I had heard of Jesus, how he healed the sick and drove out demons. When he came to my village, I went to see him. He knew what was troubling me. He spoke to the demons and told them to leave me. And they did. And from that day on, I followed him as he journeyed from town to town. I followed him listening and learning. I followed him all the way to Calvary. I don't know anything about politics or religion. I don't know what Jesus could have done to deserve this punishment. All he ever showed others, all he ever showed me, was love. None of this makes sense to me. And he knew this was going to happen. He told us that it would. Who is this 
man who drives out demons, who heals the sick, who speaks of love, and walks to his death with such peace. Jesus, please, don't leave me now. Only just begun to understand you. But Mary speaks of an ordinary life. <coughs> Is your life ordinary? Witness how Simon the Cyrene encounters the extraordinary in his ordinary life. I was in Jerusalem to take care of the business. It was Friday and I want to wrap things up, wrap things close up for Sabbath. The man I needed to see was just up the road and I tweeted to just trying to see cows pass by. In the middle of the crowd, he was a badly beaten man carrying wooden cross. I said carrying, but he could hardly stand on his feet. Just then, a Roman soldier from the crowd grabbed me and told, helped me to help this man carry his cross. Not me, I said. What has this man to do with me? Another Roman soldier would have been shouted, help him. I only wanted to finish my business and get home to my two sons. But with Roman soldier, what choice did I have? So I took the cross on his shoulder. It was incredibly heavy. So heavy that I just dropped it to through my own shoulder. How just man held it up? He started walking. As I dragged his head from the cross, the beaten man walked alongside me. As I looked around him, he looked back at me, and suddenly the cross became lighter. We continued to just hit Kong Kong with us just outside the city walls. When we got to the top, the soldier told him to set the cross down. I guess I was free to go, but I didn't. I stayed long enough to watch the soldier lay his man out on the cross. When they started driving to his hands and feet, I had to turn away. I couldn't watch. I ran down that hill and back to the city gate where I sat and cried. What have I done? I have on this painful death. Why did I do this? Was there something else I could have done? Simon, there's nothing more nor nothing better you could have done. Do any of you have the patience and strength to share in the suffering of another? How much does it take to comfort another human being? Witness this in the simple action of Veronica. I was on my way to my sister's house, walking through the streets of the city, when I heard a commotion. People yelling and screaming obscenities. It was horrible, the things they were shouting. I couldn't tell where this crowd was, and I really wanted to avoid it. But when I turned the corner, there were two Roman guards who told me to get out of the way. So I stepped into a doorway to allow the crowd to pass. Following the guards was a group of people, smiling and laughing and singing. This didn't look like the ugly crowd that I had just heard a moment ago. But as this group passed, I saw behind them a man carrying a wooden cross. Where he was accompanied by a couple more Roman guards one of whom had a whip that he used to hit this man with the cross. The man with the cross was badly beaten, bruised and bloody, and barely able to carry his whip. So I looked at the thorns that were placed on his head. He turned and looked at me. His eyes betrayed none of the pain I am sure he was feeling. And suddenly, I felt a calmness settle over me. He turned back to look ahead and move on. And the other crowd that followed him moved past. It was odd. I could no longer hear the crowd. The screens in the other cities were silent, but they were obviously still yelling them. I stood transfixed, unable to move until after the crowd had passed. And then I felt that I needed to do something to help this poor man. So I pushed my way through the crowd to get back to this man with the cross. It seemed like the crowd had grown in size. 
It took me so long to get through it. But I finally did. I pushed past the Roman guards and walked right up to this man who stopped and looked at me. I looked back at him and felt that calm again. An incredible sense of peace reading from this man's face. I wanted so much to help him. So I took off my veil and began to gently wipe the blood and sweat from his face. And then everything disappeared. The crowd was gone. The streets were quiet. And I was all alone. Except for the image of this man's face on my veil. Veronica is left alone with Jesus. Moments later, another woman is left alone with her son. death so many times. Trying to prepare us for it. Prepare me for it. But there was always something that would happen later. Sometime in the distant future. I had begun to hope the prophecies were wrong. That he wouldn't have to die. Prophecies for his accurate as those about the rest of his life and his birth. I remember his birth, his conception. I was so young. I couldn't understand what was happening. But God had in mind when I said yes to that angel. But that's exactly what I said. Be general to me according to your word. I remember how Joseph stood by me during this confusing time. How we worked to raise our son on a carpenter's earth in this poor little town. It was a simple and complicated life. I went to Calvary to get in Cana, and I asked Jesus to help my friends. We are asking, he said. Why did not? The simple request of the son by his mother would enter to some authority he had never seen. I'm not talking about changing the water into wine. I'm talking about the obedience. I'm not foolish enough to think that it could be any different. He was a human being. He had the ability to choose what to do and what not to do. Once he understood who he was, there was no stopping him. He always made his own choices. Even now, at the hour of his death, This one. You know, he always talked of 
the joke took all of this sorrow. And still I grieve. I paced and paced most of the night trying to make sense of this horrible day, trying to find a moment of peace. There's little rest for the living. I needed to do something more. I decided to go to the tomb at sunrise. He needed to be better cared for, better dressed for his final rest. As I walked to the tomb, I couldn't stop thinking how this man, who drove out demons, who healed the sick, who spoke of love, knew something more. Jesus, help me. I want to understand you. <laughs> 